Hey, Health Junkie, have you been thinking or saying, when I retire, I'm going to do X, Y, Z? No matter what age you are, you're probably thinking about retirement at some point or you've thought about it and what that looks like. Now, this episode, we're going to dive deep into, do you have to retire anyway? What does retirement really look like? And one of the biggies Are you living your life for someone else? Are you living it out of habit? Or are you living it in terms of what's true for you? Something big to be thinking about. So in this episode, I'm actually going to interview Ron Pevney. He's talking all about creating an amazing purposeful life in your older years. Now, I guess you could say he's laying the groundwork for after work life and what that looks like, who you are, what's your purpose. Ron has been dedicated to assisting people in negotiating life's transitions as they create lives of purpose for 45 years. So I think he's got a little experience. He is the author of Conscious Living, Conscious Aging, and he's the founder of the Center for Conscious Eldering, which is based in Colorado. And for 20 years, he and his team have been presenting workshops and retreats across North America to support people in bringing themselves to their purpose, growth, and creating a commitment to serve others in their elder years. Ron brings up so many things that I've only started to think about being in my midlife at this point. And really, the closer I get to retirement age, I do think like, hmm, what am I going to do? Do I really want to retire? I've found that the folks who stay busy tend to live longer. So nevertheless, something to ponder. What are you going to do once you retire? Or are you even going to retire? Let's introduce you to Ron Pevney. Hey, Health Junkies. I have Ron Pevney on today, and we're going to be talking about not only conscious living, but conscious aging, which is a concept I have to admit a lot of folks might not have been introduced to. So I'm really excited to talk about that. But more than anything, Ron, welcome to Health Fix Podcast. Well, thank you, Janine. It's an honor to be with you today. Well, I'm certainly excited to talk about conscious eldering because, you know, we we think about getting older, we see what society kind of portrays out there. We see the commercials on TV of all the pharmaceutical medications and and things of that nature. And I know that there are a lot of people that are looking at that going, that doesn't align with my mission for getting older. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing when you founded the Center for Conscious Eldering back in 2010, you were thinking the same thing. I There's so much more to getting older. There is indeed. There is so much more. Um we, li- we live in a, a world, Janine, that does not have a role and certainly not an honored role for older adults. Mm-hmm. And throughout most of history, older adults have had an honor role, honored role, the role of elder in their societies. Mm-hmm. But we don't know what to do with our older people. And oftentimes, mostly what we hear about older people, it's almost like age is seen as a disease and older people are seen as a drain on the economy you know, taking the jobs young people might have. And so many people do not have a a vision of what an empowering uh, later part of their life can look like. There's no vision at all. And so people just kind of live day to day, uh, seeking as much pleasure as they can, looking for whatever security they could find and trying to fill the hours. And for a lot of people, as you said, that is not satisfying. That's not fulfilling. People are looking for more. So the kind of people who are interested in my work and and there are many other people helping to promote a positive new vision of aging, uh, 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 these people who are looking for more come to us seeking a vision for how they can feel relevant and how they can how they can thrive rather than just. I like to think of growing into wholeness rather than just growing old. And so that's the work that I'm committed to and have been for a long time. Yeah, 40, 45 years of, of assisting people in negotiating life transitions is is what I have here. And I had to clarify with you because I was like 45 years of, of the Center for Conscious Eldering, but I got it straight. So, you know, I'm guessing with 45 years of experience, you've seen a lot of transition in society's view of elders. 
What would you do? You think it's gotten worse? Do you think it's gotten better since you started out? What would you say? You know, I think that in the last 45 years anyway, I think things have gradually begun to get better. But we're so far, we're so far from from getting where we can be. Uh, Ageism is still pervasive. And I don't just mean ageism out there. I'm talking about the ageism that so many of us have internalized from the time we were were little. Um, I think what's positive is that uh, I know, I know when I was a child and a, and a teenager, and as my parents were aging, uh, there was retirement, and then there was there was the equivalent of sitting on the porch or puttering around the house. That's a, that, that's a common word, putter. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're old, you putter. Yes, yes. <laughs> and um, um, you know, perhaps engaging in a hobby like my dad did, and my mother my mother had a hobby. But that was about it. What has changed, especially I think in the last 20 or 25 years, is there's a whole uh, set of, of, um, of, of, I guess you might say, aging philosophies that are reaching a whole lot of people. And many people lump them all together and just call it the positive aging movement. Mm-hmm. But, you know, people now recognize that our lifestyle can help us to be healthier for a long time. You know, people people now recognize that, hey, you know, we can be active, we can be engaged, we can be doing all kinds of things. This idea of just sitting around and puttering uh, doesn't, doesn't suit us. There's a lot more that's possible. Um, people are, you know, there are all kinds of efforts at community. There's a, a senior co-housing. There are all kinds of things now that are helping older people have a more vibrant life. And that's all wonderful. I think what we do with conscious eldering is we add a piece that is missing from a lot of the positive aging and the active aging and the healthy aging and these other approaches. We have a strong focus on not just what you can do as you age, but who you can be. A focus on growth, a focus on aging as an opportunity to to grow and to serve and to to actually have a role to aspire to. And the reason we call it the Center for Conscious Eldering is eldering is a process, as I see it, for intentionally working toward growing into that life stage that we all have the potential for of elderhood. And I believe that elderhood is indeed a distinct life stage. It's different from midlife. Uh, It's been a life stage. It's been honored in societies around the world up until maybe the Industrial Revolution. And it's something that we have the opportunity to grow into, but it takes intention. It takes focus. You're not just going to drift into bringing forth all those qualities that comprise an elder, you have to work at that, or at least most of us have to work at that. And so our work is to help people to to see the potential for growth, personal growth, emotional growth, spiritual growth as they age, while they be as active as they feel called to be, while they are engaged as they feel called to be. But um, the main focus is on bringing forth the elder within, which is a precious opportunity and a precious, uh, the final stage in our lives. It's fascinating to me to think about it because I'm in a stage where, you know, a lot of folks are working on growth personally now at this stage, midlife, but thinking further and and what things look like in your next transition. Because I think a lot of us think like we get older and then it's done. Like we we don't grow, we stop growing. So this is a beautiful mm-hmm. way to start thinking about what does the next transition, what is my purpose? Because I think at least what I've seen in a lot of my my older patients, my father included, my my dad's eighty seven, or actually he's eighty eight now. His he feels like he's lost his purpose, and this sounds like you're reawakening purposes in folks. Yeah, and I, I think. Uh... 
perhaps if we needed to find a synonym for the term conscious <laughs> eldering, a good synonym would be um, purposeful aging. Purposeful aging. And you you know, working in the medical field, you, you know how important purpose is to one sense of well-being. Purpose isn't just, you know, a nice thing to have. Well, wouldn't it be great if I had a purpose? But there is so much research now uh, that backs up uh, wisdom from the world's wisdom traditions that have been there forever that says that having a sense of purpose, a reason for getting up in the morning that's big, that's bigger than just yourself, is vital for physical well-being and so much research is showing that having a strong sense of purpose greatly diminishes the chances of getting Alzheimer's and other dementia. Every day there are new studies that show how important purpose is. And so I think the work that we do is to really um, support people and encourage people in finding purpose in their elder years. I, I find it fascinating that you know, a lot of us and, and myself included, I think, too, here, we don't really tap into the fact that we have unique capabilities, right? We have unique skills and maybe they didn't come out while we were working or in our career, but we can utilize them. We have the choice to utilize them. I almost yeah. feel like sometimes we don't feel in control of our own lives. Do you find that with a lot of the folks that come to to work with you? Yeah, we do indeed. And um I think for so many people, um, in their mind, the unique skills and, you know, hopefully wisdom that they have gained throughout their lives up to, up to the point of retirement, for so many people, those somehow get retired as you, as you retire. And yet they don't need to be retired. And one of the gifts of retirement, you know, for those who choose it, and I think Everybody's listening to your show knows that reti uh, retirement, it's hard to even define it anymore. It looks like so many different things for so many different people. But um, uh, retirement provides the freedom for many people to be able to find other expressions of their gifts. To be able to remember what, what, what in them brings them most alive that perhaps they didn't have the freedom to really pursue very much, either through their work or through whatever when they were younger, but now they've got the freedom. And so to get in touch with what brings you alive and then to use that in service to your own well-being and in service to the world around you, which I think is, is critical. That's always defined the role of elder service to the community. To be able to do that is an incredible gift of retirement. Gosh. You first have to get past all the, I think, internalized ideas that somehow our purpose and our meaning and our relevance end the day we retire. Yeah. Yeah. And that's internalized and it's strong in a whole lot of people. And even people, you know, who who read books like like my book, uh, Conscious Living, Conscious Aging, who go to retreats, who, you know, are, are committed to their growth. Even them have internalized a whole lot of uh, disempowering ideas, and you can't help it. You know, from the day you're a child, these ideas are all around you. And so we really have to work hard to um, transform and move beyond these internalized ideas that limit us as we age. And I, 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 I was going to add one thing I don't want to. Um, somehow communicate, as I think sometimes uh, I hear among people who work in this field, that aging is all a bed of roses. And that after retirement, you know, you can go and do all these incredible things and live passionately and be of service. And, uh, and, and you're going to be feeling great and you're going to be strong until the day you die. And that's a reality, I believe, that no matter what we do, even though it's important to take care of ourselves in, in all the ways we can, we're going to suffer losses. We're going to suffer diminishments as we age. But as we suffer certain losses and diminishments, it's like there's a potential for our inner life to grow. 
-hmm. It's almost like a, a compensation. We lose something here. But here's a chance for us to grow inwardly in so many ways. And that's one of the real gifts of elderhood, I believe. Oh, my gosh. It, it's it's profound how much you can, you know, if you choose that route, right, to, mm -hmm. to grow from a loss. I mean, I've seen two different directions, right? When, when say someone loses their significant other, you know, there's either the downward spiral or there's the, the new person that emerges. And, and it's such a beautiful thing to see. Now with folks that come to your center or, or folks that have commented from reading your book have, have folks kind of given you like a synopsis or I guess maybe what I would say is like, in general, do you feel that most of the issue is internal? more than the external in terms of where folks find themselves stuck after a certain point in life? No, I don't think you can say most of it's internal or you could say most external. Those are both very, very powerful forces. Okay. Because there are a lot of people who have, have, in many ways, come free from a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, the stereotypical disempowering ideas, mm -hmm. but they look around them, and they don't see any kind of a role for older adults. They don't see a role of, of elders being honored. Mm -hmm. They see all this uh, uh, the many different flavors of ageism, and it can get incredibly discouraging. People come to our retreats and they leave a retreat with a sense of, of purpose. And yeah, this, I want, this is how I want to appear in the world. But it is hard as heck to find opportunities. It's hard to find others who think the way that they think. And so it can be an incredible challenge there. And that's why I believe it is so important. And, and my, my passion and my calling and that of, of many others is to slowly but surely help to bring the role of elder back to a role of honor and respect. And as that happens, then more and more opportunities are going to arise for people to really, in their own unique way, uh, uh, embody elderhood. And as we see more and more older people living with purpose and meaning, then they are setting an incredible example. They're modeling for the younger generations what's possible. Yeah. So the younger people see older people, and they just don't see somebody who's just sitting around uh, with nothing to do except uh, uh, play pickleball all day. I'm not putting down pickleball, <laughs> but they see people They see people who are, are truly thriving and trying to make a difference in their community, and the younger people are not going to then... Uh, internalize all the same negative stereotypes. And so gradually we have to shift to a culture of, of people who are aging consciously and, and who are owning the role of elder. And slowly but surely, I believe we're going to make societal shifts. But this particular point, the kind of work that I do and people who think like me and, uh, uh, you know, it's on the fringe. I'm certainly yeah. not pretending it's mainstream, but uh, I think we all know that things be change begins in the fringe, and there are tipping points. And if enough people on the fringe are are biting away at a, a a dominant paradigm, all of a sudden one day you find that whoa, something big has changed. We've seen that in a lot of things culturally in our world, and I think that can be, and hopefully uh, is the path that, that we're taking when we think about aging. Yeah, I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. Now, of course, you've got me curious. You've got both, you've got retreats. You also have the center it is, help me understand with the Center for Conscious Eldering, is it all retreats or can folks come on a, a weekly basis, daily basis? Uh -huh. Give us a, a little more scoop about what's going on there in Colorado. Okay. Well, the Center for Conscious Eldering is not a physical place. Aha. Okay. Okay. So if you if you come to visit me, you're <laughs> not going to be coming to, to a wonderful retreat center. I've had dreams throughout my life of having a physical center, and for a lot of reasons, it's just never, never coalesced to, to happen. 
So the Center for Conscious Eldering is myself and three or four uh, talented, equally passionate colleagues who offer week-long Choosing Conscious Elderhood retreats around the country, and we're beginning to offer some in Europe. I'm going to do the Ooh. our second one in Ireland in, in September. And we offer shorter weekend workshops, some of which we uh, organize and orchestrate, but most of which um, happen when an organization invites us to come and offer a weekend retreat for them. And then uh, we all do some writing. I'm the one who has written the book, Conscious Living, Conscious <laughs> Aging. And, uh, uh, you know, talk, talk to people like you on podcasts and things. And that is what the Center for Conscious Eldering is. Okay. And if, okay. if any of your listeners uh, have the good fortune to have the financial well-being that they'd like to support a physical center, I would love to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> I. I can imagine. I can imagine. I mean, it, it in my mind, I was thinking, okay, you're in Colorado, so you're in a beautiful place to yes. to host something of that nature. Now, I know it, it's not it's easier said than done, of course. Now, of course, I'm also curious, though, and, and I know a lot of listeners are probably like, okay, okay, Ron, so I come to one of your, your retreats. We go to you know, Europe, we go to Ireland with you. What, what kind of things are we going to learn? How are we going to start? Take us through the process of, of what we're going to experience. Well, if you come to one of our, our week-long Choosing Conscious Elderhood retreats, and by the way, I just might add that the place that uh, we have done the most and that people oftentimes associate us with is Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. Georgia O'Keeffe made it famous. It's an incredible retreat center. We've done 23 week-long retreats there over about 15 years. If you come on one of our retreats, you're going to find an environment where as much as possible is done out, outdoors in beautiful natural settings. Because uh, as you and I, and I'm sure most of your listeners know, there's something about the natural world that opens our hearts and our minds that you just can't do when you're indoors in a hotel room or a church basement or something like that. You're going to uh, find that you're in an atmosphere where there is a huge amount of sharing uh, among the participants. And our retreats usually have no more than 13 or 14 participants and two guides. And we learn a lot from each other. And I'll tell you, the, the depth of sharing that happens in these retreats is absolutely incredible. And we have a structure we've refined over the years. And I think we're really good at, at helping people to feel comfortable in, in sharing authentically and honestly and deeply quickly. Um, we're going to um, we're going to explore what I consider the the five pillars of, of, of conscious eldering. And we have a lot of experiential ways and practices to explore them. And, and just briefly I'll say that the five pillars are the first one is the power of our beliefs in shaping how we age. The second one is um, the importance of reviewing and uh, coming to terms with our past, with who we've been up to now, healing what needs to be healed, letting go what needs to be let go so that we can move forward into a new life chapter. The third pillar is purpose the importance of purpose and how we find uh, that sense of purpose that I believe is is deeply embedded in each of us, but a great many of us need help in, in getting in touch with it, and how to live intentionally and purposefully. The fourth pillar that we explore is community, and we explore that by the kind of community that we form together so people experience it, and what we share with each other about what we know about how to find other like-minded people, other kindred spirits to help support our visions for, for our, our aging. And the fifth pillar is a an ever-deepening um, commitment to our spirituality. And we don't we don't teach some kind of a dogma, we're not some kind of a religion, but uh it's understood that uh getting in touch with whatever that, that that deep spiritual dimension is in each of us that's 
bigger than just our personality and our ego is is vital to our well-being especially as we age it's a source of our our vision the source of our healing and so in various ways we explore those five themes as i say we spend a lot of time outdoors we uh we share lots of of poetry that everybody brings poetry that is inspirational to them we have ceremony and ritual we have a drumming circle every morning to to build the energy and to help shift us into that intuitive heart-centered mode because we don't want to just be over there just philosophizing we want to be coming from the heart um we have uh an evening of storytelling where everybody tells a story about one of the most important growth experiences of their life and what they learned from it. A fire ceremony to help support people in, in letting go of, of, of some of that, that it's time to let go of now. And we have a day of uh, sunrise to sunset of solitude on the land. And we, we give people lots of preparation to help them be safe and to help them know how to best use that that precious time to to do whatever the inner work is that feels most important to them at this particular point. And being on the land in solitude in an incredible place like Ghost Ranch or wherever we do these retreats is, I mean, like, wow, how often do people have a chance to do something like that? And and so that's uh, it takes place over seven days. It's a very immersive experience. Uh, most people say that it's the deepest experience of community they've ever had in their lives. And most people leave with a commitment to doing all they can to move forward into, uh, to move forward on their journey toward elderhood. So that's what we do. I love doing it. It brings me alive. That's one of the reasons I do it. I'm more alive doing this than any, anything else I do. Well, I mean, it, it it makes sense. It's beautiful. It sounds like an amazing experience. And and what I'm thinking about is, okay, after folks leave, I'm guessing you guys have a way to connect with folks to hear stories. Would you mind sharing some some of the fascinating stories you've had of growth and and even what folks have developed in terms of programs beyond leaving uh, Ghost Ranch or or any retreat, I should say? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll begin by saying that uh, that question is so important because I think a lot of people and maybe a lot of your listeners have gone to retreats and things where you go and you get incredibly inspired, you know, and everything about the setting and the way we, we do what we do inspires people deeply. And you think, oh, my God, I'm going to go home and I'm going to be living this way forever. And you realize that the moment you get home and... Um, you're confronted with everyday life that all of a sudden that state of consciousness fades quickly. So what's critical, and we spend a lot of time, especially uh, in the final couple of days of our retreats, focused on when the high fades. How do you how do you keep alive what was most important, what touched you the most deeply, what made some kind of a difference in this experience? How do you keep that alive when you when you uh, get back home? Uh, one way that we support that is that um, after a retreat, we have a, uh, uh, a two-hour Zoom call about a month after the retreat where people have a chance to begin to share, well, what's it like trying to take this home? What am I doing with it? And then we encourage, even though we're not in a position to sponsor or orchestrate, but we encourage, and it usually happens, the group, or at least most of the group, to come together kind of a self, self-led self type of situation. And many of them come together about once a month to continue uh, 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 to support each other in community. And this usually lasts, you know, for, well, these things usually last for a year, maybe, maybe more than a year. Um, ultimately, uh, though, I don't think any kind of a Zoom community is going to have the longevity as what, what people really most need is to find community where they live. Okay. Find some kindred spirits, whether it's one or two people or whether it's uh, larger numbers uh, that uh, uh, can support each other on on this challenging uh, and rich journey into, into a conscious elderhood. 
I think uh, one thing that uh, a lot of people do when they get home is they indeed try to find community and 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 uh, oftentimes they'll find a um uh might call it a conscious aging buddy mm -hmm. or two or three buddies somebody that can support their intentions and they can support this other person and um uh through that support they can they can uh, keep moving forward uh, on their journey of growth um some people all of a sudden find that uh, the poet or the writer that's been in them all of a sudden starts to come alive. They experience sparks of that on the retreat. A lot of people come home and they say, yeah, I, I now have at least the beginnings of a real sense of what the gifts are that I can give my community. And then they make a, a, a concerted effort to look for opportunities in the community or sometimes they have to start and create opportunities to give their particular gifts to um, to the community. Many people um, uh, are reminded on these retreats of uh, of how vital their relationship is to to the earth and to the planet, and they see what's happening to the planet. And many people choose to uh, get involved in in some type of uh, of uh, ecological activism or some kind of social ap activism or something where they can help make a difference because they recognize that the well-being of the larger whole and the well-being of each of us is totally interconnected. You cannot separate them. Uh, there's so many ways that uh, uh, people use the experience. And, you know, I'll be honest, I think there's some people that get home and, and maybe can't find the support and, um, Perhaps they end up losing the oomph and losing the zest and losing the the zeal. And for those kind of people, oftentimes just coming to another retreat, whether it's with us or, or, or something else that touches into some of the same things, um, or, or, or maybe even um, just slowly and mindfully reading a really good book like mine or some of the others, can all of a sudden help to um, uh, reignite the spark for people. You know, and so it, uh, I wish I was in a position to to be, I guess, more aware of each individual and, and, and the impact the experience has had on them. But retreat leaders just don't have, <laughs> don't have the wherewithal to have that awareness. But uh, I do the best I can and I love what I see generally. Well, you know, I mean, it's hard, right? It's hard when you're you're working with people's emotions, people's, you know, level of of yeah. get up and go, let's call it that. Um and and sometimes, you know, we get the oomph and then then it fades. And you know, this is where I was going to ask about the book, is a book a great way to reignite or is it a great way to ignite? Is it is it both ends? How how do you see the book fitting in for for folks? Is it an inspiration piece or more of um, a how to? G give us the give us a little bit of background on your book compared to what experience someone might have in a retreat. For, for example. yeah, so the short answer is all the above. <laughs> uh, I suppose you'd like a little, a little more of an answer than that. Um, <laughs> We lead people through a week-long process on these retreats. You know, I talked about some of the major themes we focus on, but the whole process is very much, uh, it follows the dynamics that have characterized rites of passage around the world forever. And I know, and I've had the privilege to, to study with with people who, who, uh, their passion has been coming to know and understand rites of passage around the world. You know, those ceremonial processes societies have used forever to help people move through major life transitions. And so we structure our retreats to incorporate the dynamics that are common to rites of passage around the world and the flow you know, and moving from the first, you know, third of the retreat, really focusing on on looking at our past and what needs to be healed, what needs to be let go, uh, what wisdom we've gained that we really need to take forward, you know, a focus on the past. 
and then in all rites of passage, as is the case in our retreats, there is an in-between phase of indeterminate length, often called the neutral zone, sometimes it's called liminal space, where we're not who we have been, we don't know who we're becoming, and we can feel lost and adrift. But that's a space that is ripe and full of potential if we allow ourselves to be in that space, endure the discomfort of it, and, and use whatever means we have to get in touch with our, our inner guidance, our inner knowing during that time so we can get some glimpses of what wants to emerge next. And then gradually there's the emergence of of, of, of uh, the vision and the guidance and that feeling within that, hey, I'm ready to now to move into a new chapter as a different person. Something in me has changed because, because any major life transition has the potential to change us. That's why we go through it. So we, we somehow become a different person who has grown bigger than we were before. So that's the process of all rites of passage. Our retreats are structured that way. So... When I envisioned writing this book, I thought, what if I could create a book that people could read and, and write it in such a way and use language in such a way and stories in such a way and everything that people can almost feel that they were out there, for instance, in the desert at Ghost Ranch as they read each chapter and they engage with some of the practices we suggest and it's not a page turner type of book. It's one that you work with slowly as a, you know, a reflective workbook. And you work your way through this whole process in the same way you would if you were on one of our retreats. And so I think for a lot of people who, for whatever reason, uh, are not ever going to come on one of our retreats, they can engage with a lot of that whole process by slowly working their way through the book. And then one thing I've included um, that I think it makes it unique and a lot of people really like about my book, every chapter, every, you know, which every chapter has a theme, every chapter closes with what I call a story by the fire. And the story by the fire of every chapter was written by somebody who's been on one of our retreats over the years, where I remembered they had a really profound experience and I asked them to write a couple pages about their particular experience on the retreat, on the land, related to that particular theme. And so it's not just me uh, uh, sharing whatever wisdom I have in the book, but it's all these wonderful stories that people can relate to, just other people like them who experience this. And these are some of the experiences they had as they went through this process. So anyway, that's uh, in a nutshell, a big nutshell, I guess. That's what, what, what my book does for people and what it's about. Oh, I I like it. I like workbook style books because you it inspires you to take action, right? And yeah, yeah. the stories, I think that that's awesome because it's going to give some, some inspiration because I think right at this stage for a lot of people, they're they're kind of running out of inspiration and looking forward and going, oh no, you know, what, what do I have next to look for? So of course I've got to ask in terms of folks that this would best be suited for, because I'm thinking, gosh, I, I want to come hang out. Am I, am I too young? Is there, is there a, and I don't want to put age into it per se, but I'm like, what kind of thought process, um, would be a perfect person who's who's listening to this right now and going, Ron, this sounds fascinating. I I want to mm -hmm. dive in. What 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 would be a prerequisite for someone to grab the book and to consider looking at mm -hmm. some of your retreats? Well, I think a prerequisite for reading the book, coming on a retreat, um, or even resonating in any way with the whole concept of conscious eldering is an understanding of and appreciation of uh, our lives as being a process of growth. And, you know, some of us who are really uh, committed to growth, as you and I, and I imagine most of your listeners are, 
they can appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But you'd be surprised how many people do not have any concept of what growth is, what personal growth is. And so as they uh, go through any of life's major changes, they're not able to consciously see the potential for growth there. They just kind of, you know, somehow drift through the change and hopefully they do a little growing. As they view their elderhood, they, they cannot relate to conscious eldering because conscious eldering is about a commitment to continually growing. And if you don't understand that and resonate with that, then why are you going to put your energy into, into exploring something like this that is totally grounded in growth? So that's a prerequisite. Um, most of the people who come on our retreats and, uh, and from what I hear who read my book probably are between um, 55 and, and 80. Mm -hmm. But uh, we certainly don't have an age prerequisite. And, you know, something I'm, I'm, I'm oftentimes asked, and I, I heard that in your question, um, well, if you're, if you're just in quote, unquote, middle age, are you too young? Is this stuff just not relevant to you until you're about to retire? And I would say, no, you're not too young. Um, I mean, think about how many people you know, probably, and I know, who when they're 10, 15 years from retirement, they're already over there talking about, boy, when I retire, I'm going to do this. When I retire, from, I'm going to do that. Yep. They're already, you know, and they're looking at their financial well-being and everything, you know, and meeting with their financial advisors, you know, maybe when they're even in their 20s. <laughs> they're planning for their life later on. And I ask, why isn't it equally important to be planning on and thinking about after I retire, if I retire, um, what am I retiring to? Not just what am I retiring from, what am I retiring to? What might it look like? What do I have to do besides trying to take care of my financial security? Um, what do What do I have to do to prepare myself so that the day that I leave my work, um, or at least soon after I leave my work, I can have meaning and purpose. Is it going to be enough for me just to focus every day on filling the hours and getting in as much play as I can? Or am I really going to feel a need to somehow be serving, using my newfound freedom to be serving my community? And so how might I start to lay the groundwork for doing something like that? And another one other important piece, I think so much of uh, uh, we haven't got into this uh, yet, uh, Janine, but so much of um, conscious eldering is about becoming increasingly aware of when we are living out of habit and when we are living out of a sense of our own uh, inner truth, what's true for us. What decisions, what visions come from what's most genuine in us and not what we've been taught by our society or the world around us? And there's all kinds of habits, and we're all creatures of habit in so many ways. So if we're going to live more aware and consciously and less out of habit, it takes a long time to begin to change old habits. And so if we can begin in midlife to be taking a look at what are some of the habitual ways that we live our lives, that we react to things, that we think about things, habitual ways that we're just kind of almost caught in. And how can we begin to maybe even in midlife um, move beyond some of our habitual ways of being and, and, and begin to practice living a little bit more consciously? That takes time, but we're preparing ourselves inwardly so that we're in that when we're in that position uh, of actually beginning to feel that in, feel our age, you know, and feel that we are entering a new chapter, then we we prepared ourselves inwardly for living that way. And that's much easier than all of a sudden finding out that, man, God, one day I'm really feeling old, maybe I'm retired. Okay, God, I better go to a workshop. I better read a book. I got to, yeah, like you're going to do that in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. It, it takes time. And that's one of the reasons that I think, and I've had people tell me, Janine, 
they said, Ron, your book is called Conscious Living, Conscious Aging, but it seems applicable to people at any point in life, moving through any major life transition. And I think, really, it is, even though it's focused on, on the transition in, into elderhood. And so I think a lot of the ways of being and dealing with ourselves inwardly um, uh, that I, I share in there are just as applicable to people in midlife or maybe even in their 20s and 30s as they are to people in their later chapters. That's a long answer to your question. Does it speak to what you were asking? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Because in my mind, of course, I'm thinking you can start to to have that awareness and consciousness at any age, but really watching it evolve. And like you're saying, staying true to yourself, you know, versus following societal norms and things of that nature. I, I think that's incredibly huge. And I think if we're we're introduced to this concept at a younger age, because I'll be honest, I like I said in the beginning of this, I, I didn't really think I was in control of my own world until mm -hmm. I got, you know, into my later 30s, early 40s. You know, I really just was flowing along, you know, not realizing that I could make choices. I could, you know, design my life. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And and what you've got here is a great way to bring that awareness to folks that, hey, I can choose whatever I want and I can make this world a better place by putting together my, my, you know, interests and my, my skills. It's yeah. Yeah. It's great stuff. I, I look forward to sharing this podcast with folks, especially your book, um, folks, conscious living, conscious aging. You got to check that out. Now, Ron, you have some other outlets where you have been an interviewer, um, with podcasts. It sounds like the, you've got a, a maybe an interview series with the saging international and the shift network would you tell us a little bit about that so that folks could maybe find it online listen in a little bit if they want to gather a little more information from you well i think anybody who's interested in their growth uh, uh i'm sure has had some awareness of the shift network because the amount of publicity that my marketing they do has been incredible now it was back in 19 um 15 16 and 17 they became aware of my work and they asked me to host in three consecutive years of what they call transforming aging summits. Mm. I'll tell you, it was an incredible experience because each year I had to round up uh, uh, 18 to 20 interviewees. And these are people across the whole spectrum who are making some kind of a difference in, in how aging is viewed in our society. Um, and so I had to round them up and I had to then do one hour interviews with all of these people and then write out write up summaries and then each year this was available um at, you know to people who who subscribed and i'll tell you i learned so much uh, interviewed about 60 different people and you know i could tell you enjoy interviewing and i enjoy <laughs> interviewing and uh you know seeing them come alive uh, talking about what they do brought me alive and the feedback I got is it brought listeners alive and it was wonderful. I don't know the particulars of how to access it now, but I think if you contact the Shift Network and do a little bit of searching, you could probably find uh, information on whether those interviews are 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 still in their archive or something and available, you know, for I guess for download and for sale. Gotcha. And this this thing I. Uh, turning points that uh, I did with uh, Saging International. And Saging International is a great organization that offers a lot of shorter workshops and webinars of all different kinds. And I think they're the, the most influential of all the conscious aging organizations out there. So somebody might look up Saging International, S-A-G-E hyphen I-N-G International. But a, a, a partner, uh, Katia Peterson, and I had the opportunity to interview um, over the last year, once a month, um, 12 people who are, are really viewed as leaders in, in helping to uh, uh, inspire a commitment to transformation in listeners, especially related to aging. Uh, people like uh, Dr. Richard Rohr, Dr. Joan Borisenko, uh, Richard Leiter, people like that, that that some of your listeners may be aware of. But we didn't interview them just about their work. 
we interviewed them about the turning points in their lives. And we wanted to know, you know, what were the dark nights of the soul? What were the mm -hmm. challenging times? What were those moments of epiphany and breakthrough when you had clear vision? Those synchronicities that supported you along the way when you needed it. It was incredible um, hearing those stories. I think they're greatly inspiring. And so if somebody goes to Saging's website, www.saging, S-A-G-E hyphen I-N-G dot org, and look around a little bit for turning points, you can uh, find how for what I think is a really uh, reasonable fee, you can get access to that whole series. And some of those are really great interviews. So. Oh, I think folks will love that. You know, we're here. We're, I'm, I'm always, always about sharing information and helping folks gather more info and especially on the topic of, of conscious aging and, and aging well. That's my mission here, you know, with the mm -hmm. podcast and uh, just enjoy what you're doing. And gosh, I'm going to have to grab a copy of your book because I do want to. Here's what it out. looks like. Can you see oh, this? Let's show, yeah, let's show it to everybody there. There's the book, guys, Conscious Living, Conscious Aging. Conscious Aging, Aging Claiming the Gifts of Elderhood. Oh, it's, it's something just special to know that when we retire or, you know, get older into our older ages, that it's not over. And I think for a lot of people, that's the biggest takeaway I want them to be thinking about here. You can reinvent yourself. You can come up with some really cool things to do. Yes, you can. And Ron is here to help you along the way. Mm -hmm. So, Ron, thank you so much for coming on. I think what we should do for now is tell folks, you know, we've got the book. They can find it at your website. Give us your website and anywhere else they can find you as well at this point in time. Yeah. Well, they can find the book through any sources that you can find books at. Uh, one I highly recommend, you can, and they can find it uh, from my publisher, Beyond Words. And they could find it from bookshop.org. Okay. And not many people know bookshop.org. They have most of the books that Amazon has. But what makes them, I think, unique and I, I, makes me love them is they give 10% of the purchase price of every book sold to a local independent bookstore. Mm. I think uh, it feels so good if you spend maybe a couple extra dollars with them versus Amazon. But uh, you know it's going to support and keep your little local bookstore going. Um We've got a website that many people uh, feel is is really useful to them, full of information of all different types and interviews and all kinds of things uh, and articles. It's uh, centerforconsciouseldering.com. Centerforconsciouseldering.com. And my contact information is there if anybody would ever like to talk or be in touch about... Uh, Anything they, they've heard today, Janine, I'd, I'd be delighted to talk to them. Awesome. You guys heard it here. There's no excuse not to have information at this point. Ron, thank you again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Janine. I really enjoyed talking with you. I wish you and your good work well. Thank you. Turning points that uh, I did with uh, Saging International. And Saging International is a great organization that offers a lot of shorter workshops and webinars of all different kinds. And I think they're the, the most influential of all the conscious aging organizations out there. So somebody might look up Saging International, S-A-G-E hyphen I-N-G International. But a, a, a partner, Katia Peterson, and I had the opportunity to interview um, over the last year, once a month, um, 12 people who are, are really viewed as leaders in, in helping to uh, uh, inspire a commitment to transformation in listeners, especially related to aging. Uh, people like uh, Dr. Richard Rohr, Dr. Joan Borisenko, uh, Richard Leiter, people like that, that that some of your listeners may be aware of. But we didn't interview them just about their work. We interviewed them about the turning points in their lives and we wanted to know, you know, what were the dark nights of the soul? What were the challenging times? What were those moments of epiphany and breakthrough when you had clear vision? Those synchronicities that supported you along the way when you needed it. It was incredible um, hearing those stories. I think they're greatly inspiring. And so if somebody goes to Saging's website, www.saging, S-A-G-E hyphen I-N-G dot org, and look around a little bit for turning points, 
you can uh, find Hal for uh, what I think is a really uh, reasonable fee. You can get access to that whole series. And some of those are really great interviews. So. Oh, I think folks will love that. You know, we're here. We're, I'm, I'm always, always about sharing information and helping folks gather more info and especially on the topic of, of conscious aging and, and aging well. That's my mission here, you know, with the mm -hmm. podcast and uh, just enjoy what you're doing. And gosh, I'm going to have to grab a copy of your book because I do want to. Here's what it know. looks like. Can you see oh, this? Let's show, yeah, let's show it to everybody there. There's the book, guys, Conscious Living, Conscious Aging. Conscious Aging, aging Claiming the Gifts of Elderhood. Oh, it's, it's something just special to know that when we retire or, you know, get older into our older ages, that it's not over. And I think for a lot of people, that's the biggest takeaway I want them to be thinking about here. You can reinvent yourself. You can come up with some really cool things to do. Yes, you can. And Ron is here to help you along the way. Mm -hmm. So Ron, thank you so much for coming on. I think what we should do for now is tell folks, you know, we've got the book. They can find it at your website. Give us your website and anywhere else they can find you as well at this point in time. Yeah. Well, they can find the book through any sources that you can find books at. Uh, one I highly recommend, you can, and they can find it uh, from my publisher, Beyond Words. And they could find it from bookshop.org. Okay. And not many people know bookshop.org. They have most of the books that Amazon has. But what makes them, I think, unique and I, I, makes me love them is they give 10% of the purchase price of every book sold to a local independent bookstore. Hmm. I think uh, it feels so good if you spend maybe a couple extra dollars with them versus Amazon. But uh, you know it's going to support and keep your little local bookstore going. Um We've got a website that many people uh, feel is is really useful to them, full of information of all different types and interviews and all kinds of things uh, and articles. It's uh, centerforconsciouseldering.com. Centerforconsciouseldering.com. And my contact information is there if anybody would ever like to talk or be in touch about uh, Anything they, they've heard today, Janine, I'd, I'd be delighted to talk to them. Awesome. You guys heard it here. There's no excuse not to have information at this point. Ron, thank you again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Janine. I really enjoyed talking with you. I wish you and your good work well. Thank you.